Please welcome our next speaker. Adam is going to be talking to us today about revolutionizing authentication with oblivious cryptography. Take it away, Adam. Thanks, Rihanna. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Crypto Village. Thank you for coming to uh, see my talk. And I'm gonna talk about a technique that we call uh, oblivious password hardening. Oblivious password hardening or oblivious password protection. All right, first some introductions. I'm Adam Everspaugh, oh hi. Um, I'm the cryptography expert at a uh, software technology company uh, called Uptake in Chicago. But what I'm presenting today is some work I did when I was a PhD student uh, at the University of Wisconsin. <clears throat> and that's joint work with these gentlemen. Uh, some of these folks are here, Sam Scott is here in the audience, um, and all these folks uh, are now at Cornell Tech. And lastly, uh, I'm gonna give a live demo of, uh, of implementation of this technique later in the talk, and that, that live demo was developed by Virgil Security, who actually has an open source version of this. Uh, and the founder of Virgil is here, uh, Dimitri Dane is here, so if you have any questions about the software or the technology, come talk to me afterwards, I'll introduce you to Dimitri. So, we use passwords every day to authenticate to our devices and to online services. But the way we store those passwords is fundamentally broken because databases are compromised, and when they are, there's no way to stop offline dictionary attacks. Today I'm gonna to present to you a new direction. A solution that not only eliminates these attacks, but also enables compromise recovery. Well, let's start with a concrete example. All right, so maybe you've gotten an email like this. Uh, scumbag polar bear connect, wants to connect with you on LinkedIn. He sends you an email. You navigate to a website that looks like this. Now, in order to log into LinkedIn, you must provide an email address and a password. And of course, LinkedIn has to store that password in some way so they can tell if it's the same password every time. Here are the typical ways uh, that websites store passwords. They either store passwords in plain text, no joke, this happens, as Twitter. Uh, they perform a salt, of, sorry, they perform a hash of that password and store the hash. They perform a hash with a salt and then they store the salt and the hash in a database. Uh, or they do something, some kind of like iterated hash function. Like you may apply the hash function say 10,000 times in a row and then store the salt in the hash. Okay, so pop quiz is a little bit of a trivia. Who here knows how LinkedIn was storing passwords in 2012? Two people, somebody I don't know right there. You wanna guess? Unsalted hashes, that's true. Now the reason we know this is not because LinkedIn had a press release, uh, it's because attackers broke into LinkedIn in 2012, they stole something like 100 million passwords, they leaked some of those online, those hashes online, and when they did, security researchers had a field day. They were able to crack most of those passwords in just two weeks with off-the-shelf hardware. Now, the reason those attacks were so devastating and so fast was because they were using unsalted hashes. But what I wanna point out to you is those attackers have 100 million passwords. Even if LinkedIn was using the, what's considered like industry standards today, like the best protection, which is some kind of iterated hash function or hard hash function, this doesn't actually stop offline attacks. It just slows them down, which means attackers just throw more iron at the problem. So all the techniques that aren't storing plain text passwords we basically call hash and hope. You're hoping the attacker is not gonna spend enough time and energy to crack those passwords because if they do, they will crack all those passwords. All right, so I'm picking on LinkedIn, but let's just say password database compromises are, uh, are really not that uncommon, right? And what I want to point out is these aren't just like fly-by-night startups. These are sophisticated technology companies. They're repeatedly breached, these passwords are stolen. They have the technology, they have the motivation, they have the skill set to stop these database breaches and yet they are often unable to do it. Okay, so of course we want to limit these breaches whenever possible, but even when they do occur, we want some kind of protection, right? We want to move beyond hash and hope. So let's look at a different way to protect passwords. In January 2015, Facebook presented this slide at Real World Crypto Conference in London. This slide is pseudocode of how password, of how Facebook processes a new or changed password when you log into Facebook. All right, so I'll give you a minute to take a look at it and then we'll talk through it. Okay, so this is what Facebook does. They take your password, they run it through a deprecated hash function called MD5. They choose a random 20 byte salt. They take the output of MD5 plus the salt, they run it through a deprecated hash function called HMAC SHA-1. They take that result, send it to a remote machine, it applies remote HMAC SHA-256 with a secret, sends the result back. They run that through a memory hard function called S-Script, take the output of S-Script, run it through HMAC SHA-256. Got that? All right, so it's a little confusing. You might be wondering, why would Facebook, who presumably knows something about security, do something like this? Well, the reason they do this is historical. <clears throat> 
Once upon a time, Facebook had 800 million passwords sitting around a database protected by MD5. Security said, holy F, we have 800 million passwords sitting around a database protected by MD5. How are we gonna fix this? Well, <clears throat> Facebook doesn't wanna make you change your password. They don't wanna wait for all 800 million users to log in so they can rehash those with say HMAC SHOT2. So instead the security team says, let's do this. Take all the existing passwords, choose a random 20 byte salt, run them through HMAC SHOT1, write that back to the database. Cool, we're done, right? Two years later, they get 1.1 billion passwords, they say, holy F, we got 1.1 billion passwords stored in HMAC SHOT1 in the database, what are we gonna do? But look, we solved this problem before. At HMAC with a secret. Doing good, right? All right, so sometime later, they want to do something better, they add S script. Now the output of S script is really long, so finally they run it through HMAC SHA2, literally just to compress it, literally just to compress it down so it fits in the database better. Okay, so what we're left with is this pseudocode, which is now an archaeological record of Facebook struggling to protect passwords. All right, but I want to point out something interesting here. Something most technology companies do. Most of this processing happens on the same server. But at some point during this processing, Facebook reaches out to a second server. That server applies an HMAC SHOT-256 with a secret held only on that server and sends a result back. And that's actually really neat. That's neat because it leads to a different kind of architecture. At a high level, the architecture looks like this. User submits a password, web server does some local processing, connects to the crypto server, crypto server applies, it sends it back. Now the reason we like this architecture, this is now critical information is split between at least two different machines. So if I break into a web server, I get passwords but no key. If I break into a crypto server, I get a key but no passwords. Okay, this is already better. But there's still some problems with Facebook's implementation. First off, there's a cryptographic key, right? Security people might say, how do I rotate that key? Well the dirty little secret inside Facebook is they can never rotate that key. Right? It's in the middle of a bunch of one-way functions. If you change that key, you effectively delete all two billion passwords in that database. So if you want to change the key, you have to keep adding these like HMAC SHA 256s to the end of the process. Okay, so that's not good. Secondly, because of this particular API, the way requests come in, it's really difficult, it's actually impossible in some cases, for a crypto server to tell the difference between a large volume of legitimate requests. Like, 10,000 different people are logging in with different passwords versus one attacker sending 10,000 guesses for a single sysadmin's account. Okay, so for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna leave behind the state of the art. I'm gonna talk about our contribution to this problem. So we like this architecture. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, start with this architecture. I'm gonna rename the crypto server to the Pythia server, and we're gonna fix some of those problems. We're gonna change the API. We're gonna change it in a way that allows the crypto server to detect online attacks. We're gonna build in support for key rotation. And key rotation is gonna be really powerful. This is gonna allow us to recover from compromises and also proactively rotate keys. And when we rotate keys, it's actually gonna allow us to cryptographically erase information that's been stolen. All right, finally, we wanted to design a service that's not just for Facebook, or people who have these huge security teams uh, and they can run their own service. We want to build a modern multi-tenant web service that allows even small companies to take advantage of the system. All right, so let's see how it works. I'm gonna talk through how a Pythia query works when a new user logs onto a website and that website's using Pythia. So user logs in in the normal way. Username, password, sent via HTTP post, protected by TLS. Web server chooses a random value, we'll call that value T. This is gonna be a user ID. He then takes that password and passes it through what's called a cryptographic blinding function. Think about this as encryption, it actually is, it's key homomorphic encryption. We'll get into the details later. But just know that this protects the password. Web server sends a query, the query has these components. It has the web server's ID, it has the user's ID, it has a blinded password, an encrypted password. That Pythia server pulls the key out of a database, that key is associated with only this web server. It then applies a uh, cryptographic PRF, a keyed PRF with that key, and uses those inputs, the user ID and the blinded password. We'll call that result Y, that result gets back, sent back to the web server. The web server then applies the unblinding function. It then stores those. We call the unblinded value, the final value, the protected password. Think about this as the same output from the Facebook algorithm when you've applied Script and a bunch of other deprecated hash functions. And then of course when the user logs in, web server does the same thing again, 
produces a new value Z prime. If the new value matches the data in the database, the password is the same. If it doesn't match, it's the wrong password. All right, let's talk about how compromise recovery works. So let's say an attacker breaks in, steals a copy of the database. Well, this web server is in a better position because the attacker can't do offline dictionary attacks without that key. Now, he does have enough information to do online accounts, online attacks. But notice that the API has changed. The API requires the requester to specify the user ID. If you specify the wrong user ID, you get the wrong result, and your guesses aren't going to work. This means the Pythia server can now tell if you're getting 10,000 requests for a single user account, and it can do something, right? It can throttle requests, it can lock accounts, it can send out alerts to sysadmins to say, hey, someone else has your password database. All right, so admin goes in, he cleans up his SQL injection, and instead of the normal process of email all your users, tell them they're screwed, they have to go change their Instagram passwords even though you're not Instagram, instead he does something different. He contacts the Pythia server and says, hey, I need to do a key rotation, I need a new key. Pythia server generates a new key and sends to the web server what we we'll call an update token. And this update token allows the web server to update the existing protected passwords from the old key to the new key. And the important thing is here, the web server doesn't have to know the original password. I don't wait for the user to log in. I can do this whenever I want. And also, the underlying password hasn't changed. We're just, change, we're just changing the key that's being used to protect that password. All right, web server finishes updating his database, tests to make sure it works, contacts the Pythia server and tells him, I'm done, erase the old key. If that key is gone and there's no copy of that key in a, in the, uh, anywhere else in the HSM or anywhere else in memory, that password database is useless, right? It's based on encrypted values for which there is no key. So even if you break into the Pythia server, if the key is gone, you don't have enough information to recover those passwords. We say that password database is cryptographically erased. You now have a big blob of useless data and some user names and user IDs. Okay. So there may be some cryptographers in the audience. Even if you're not, we're gonna talk about the properties that we need to build this kind of a service. So we need a scheme that's gonna be deterministic. Given the same key, same user ID, same password, it needs to produce the same result every time. That's how we know if we got the password correct. We need a scheme that's pseudo-random, and really by that I mean uh, passwords should look like random numbers, they shouldn't leak, and sorry, protected passwords should look like random numbers, they shouldn't leak anything about the inputs. We need this weird property. It's like partial message privacy. I want to hide the password, but I want to require you to specify in the clear the correct user ID. And finally, we need key rotation, right? Hopefully it's obvious how, how very powerful that is to operators. Okay, so when we started doing this work uh, in 2014, we looked around at existing schemes, there's things like pseudo-random functions like HMAC, there's oblivious pseudo-random functions, partially blind signatures, which give you this kind of partial message privacy. There's a bunch of techniques for key updatable encryption, and proxy re-encryption. But in 2014 at least, when we were working on this, actually 2015 we were working on this, there actually was no scheme that provided all four of these properties simultaneously. So we, uh, the authors of Pythia, we had to invent a new scheme. We called it a partially oblivious PRF. It's a sexy name, right? Forgive me, I'm a cryptographer, I'm not a marketer. All right, so let's go through, let me give you a high level intu intuition about how we're gonna build such a scheme. So, how do you build an oblivious PRF? Well, the first thing we need is a secure, uh, a secure reversible blinding function. So I can apply some function, some blinding function, usually with some random input, think of that as like a key. And of course, if I apply the unblinding function, that should give me the original value back. Now I need a, a secure reversible blinding function that commutes mathematically with a pseudorandom function. And by that I mean, if I blind the password and then apply the pseudorandom function, it's the same as if I were to do it in the opposite order. I applied the pseudo random function first and then blinded it. If I have these three things, I can build an oblivious PRF. So I blind a password, the client blinds the password, sends it to the server. Server has the key, applies the keyed pseudo random function to the blinded input, sends it back to the client, the client applies the unblinding function, right? And then should it be clear that we can rewrite it like this, and hopefully then it's still clear that blinding and unblinding cancel out. At the end of the protocol, the client who initiated the protocol learns the output of a keyed pseudorandom function over a password, but he doesn't learn the key. And on the server side, the server side can apply the key, but never sees the password. Okay, so that's an oblivious PRF. Uh, math warning, I have one slide of math, so for those of you who need to check your email and don't like math, go into it. For those of you who like math, 
Sorry, it's only one slide. All right, so here's our partial oblivious PRF construction. There have actually been sort of a number of similar constructions in the academic literature since, but this is my talk, so screw you guys, I'm presenting mine. All right, so we need to use something called a bilinear pairing. And by that I mean three elliptic curves, we'll call them G1, G2, and GT, and a function that takes inputs from two and maps them into the third. And this function has this property. If I take a to the power x, b to the power y, run them through the blinding function, it should be the same as if I were to send a and b through the blinding function and raise that to the power x, y. Okay, with this we can now build our Pythia protocol. It works like this. The web server hashes a password, so it turns it into a group element, uh, uh, an elliptic curve element, raises the power of r, where r is just some random integer. This is a blinding function and this is really strong, it's called information theoretic security. Okay, so here's our blinding function. Send those values to the Pythia server. Pythia server then hashes the user ID, passes the user ID and the value x through the pairing function, raises the whole thing to the power of k. That's our keyed pseudo random function. The unblinding function is then I compute the inverse of r and I raise the whole thing to the power of r. If I write it out, it looks like this. And then, hopefully it's clear that you can see that the blinding factor and the deep unblinding factor cancel out and what I'm left with is hash of the user ID, hash of the password, pass through a pairing function, raised to the power of a key k. And this thing is deterministic, right? The same inputs, it always produces the same outputs. Okay. The rest of you guys who don't like math and are busy checking your email, you can wake up. All right. So, that was a deep dive. Let's pop up to the high level and let's talk about what this construction gives us. On the Pythia side, using this construction means the service has enough information to detect online attacks. You have to specify the user ID and you have to be right about it. Can't play shenanigans with it because if you specify the wrong user ID, you get the wrong output every time. But importantly, he can apply the pseudorandom function, never learns anything about the password. On the web server side, he can compute through this protocol this keyed pseudorandom function, but he never sees the key, right? This is key because if you break into the web server, you scrape memory, you steal the disk, you know everything the web server knows and if the web server has the key anywhere, then the attacker probably has the key too. All right, so our goal was to, as an academic, my goal was to publish this paper, but uh, now our goal is to kind of get this into the world and, uh, and get people to use it. And so, uh, so a company called Virgil Security has built sort of our production grade, not sort of, it built a production grade version of Pythia that's way better than my research prototype. Um, you can find out more about it at this website, pythia.virgilsecurity.com. They have a full open source implementation, you can get this stuff from GitHub, the code is very good. And I'll, I'm gonna give you a demo of this. If anyone is brave enough and has Golang on your computer, you can follow along in this demo. And I promise that there's no shady stuff in this code. I've never looked at the code, but I promise that there's no shady stuff in it. Okay, what I'm doing is downloading, uh, via Golang, I'm downloading the package uh, for this sort of demo version of the Pythia client, but it hits a real live Pythia server and it's running the Pythia protocol. And uh, now I'm going to set up a client ID. So all I'm doing here is uh, choosing a random ID and this is going to be my like uh, web server ID, this is my random web server ID. So there it is, very exciting. Um, so here's the tool. Uh, it's designed to be very simple, obviously, right? You can get help, you can protect a password, and you can check a password, right? This is really all we need to do. So let's protect a password. Okay, so what I've done is said, uh, I want to protect a password. 
Here's the username. Of course, my voice is my passport. And then it's hard to see, but I've redirected the output to a file. And what the client is doing is exposing the standard error, a little bit of demo information so we can kind of get some idea of what's happening, right? So the first value is that blinded password that we talked about. This is the response we get back from the server, at least the first part of it, the response we get back from the server. And then finally is the deep blinded value, the protected password. Okay, so here's my protected password. Uh, it's not obvious, but this first part here should match. Um, it's possible I use the wrong pass uh, file here. But the first part is a password, and the rest is actually like a zero knowledge proof and some other fancy information, which I totally skipped over because uh, we don't really have time to cover that stuff. Um, but essentially, this is the protected password. Check a password. We'll check this password. And we're lucky. Big surprise, password matches. Big surprise, password matches. All right, so now let's insert an error. Let's say uh, your voice is my passport. Password. Okay, password does match, right? Big surprise. All right, so let's do this a bunch of times. All right, if the Pythia server has some policy on it, uh, we should only get a certain number of, uh, of these queries before we get some kind of response. Okay, so there we go. So the Pythia server is, is monitoring these inbound user IDs, and after you get, say, 10 or so checks, they put a throttle on and they say, okay, great, you have to wait 60 seconds or so, right? So this is a very sort of simple policy that allows us to quickly slow down any kind of online attacks. All right, so that's the, that's the totality of the demo. Let's go back and talk a little bit more. Okay, so that's how it works. Uh, there's some deep theory going on in there. Um, uh, there's a very cool, uh, very simple uh, interface to use it, but let's talk about performance, right? So if both the Pythia server and the web server are on the same local area network, and that's important because then network latency sort of doesn't factor into these numbers, then one can execute a Pythia query in about five milliseconds, right? So you're probably thinking, what does that mean, right? So let me give you some context. If you're following the latest guidelines from NIST, which is to use, say, SHA-256 hash, not, not say, it is to use SHA-256 hashing, hashing with at least 10,000 iterations, on the same hardware, that takes nine milliseconds. If you're using an even fancier function, bcrypt is one, scrypt is another. Let me give you an example. bcrypt set with a work factor of 11, which is kind of a popular uh, setting for obvious reasons, um, takes about seven milliseconds, right? So Pythia today is already faster than the current versions, and you get things like protection from online attacks and key rotation. And I want to point out that as computers get faster, we actually make bcrypt slower. Right? Because as GPUs get faster, we're processing these things on CPUs, so we keep turning up the work factor. So seven milliseconds is kind of like the least amount of processing time. But as CPUs get faster, Pythia just gets faster. Right? So we're already ahead of these password protection mechanisms, and Pythia is going to continue to outpace them. Some other notes about uh, performance. Um, on the eight core machine that we tested in EC2, a Pythia server, single Pythia server, can handle about 1,300 queries per second. A few more queries per second, you throw more iron at the problem, right? You put a little balancer and a couple more servers. Storage is excellent for a Pythia server, right? Pythia server doesn't store information about users, it stores information about web servers, right? So let me give you an example. If a Pythia server is serving 100 million web servers, each, with those, each of those web servers with an arbitrary number of clients, say 100 million clients, Pythia server needs about 20 gigabytes, right? That's enough information to store keys for individual web servers and a little bit of extra information for rate limiting. That information is uh, uh, ephemeral. All of this is to say we can deploy Pythia today on standard hardware. All right, so most of this talk has been about web servers. That's kind of a very compelling use for Pythia. But really, Pythia is really good whenever you have a password and a network connection and also like security. So let me give you two more examples just at a high level. First is file encryption, right? Commonly today, you log into a MacBook or a Windows machine, you type in a password, it grinds away on your password, uses that for a key. 
that's good unless you lose your password and you're worried that someone's going to crack it. Now, if it only has like say your Instagram photos on there, it's not a big deal, but if it's got like client data, health information, financial records, that might not be good enough, right? So instead, you could use a password, connect to Pythia, use it to generate a hardened password, and then use that for an encryption key. And then, if you lose your device, or say the FBI takes it, if you can get to the Pythia server and say, hey, I lost my device, will you please delete that key? That means you can actually cryptographically erase that device, even if that device is offline or powered off, right? Because it needs a key and that key is not on that device. All right, so the last sort of compelling use is something called a Bitcoin brain wallet, right? So Bitcoins are very valuable, uh, sorry, Bitcoin wallets tend to be very valuable because of the sort of skyrocketing price of these things. And there's a question of like, sort of how do you protect this digital asset, right? So you can imagine I could take, uh, generate a very complex password, run it through S-Crypt, make it grind away for a long time, and just hope that somebody else out there doesn't grind away harder and find my password. Because oh, the public key is sort of sitting somewhere, not sitting somewhere, it's sitting up on the blockchain. You can imagine using Pythia for this, right? You type in a password, possibly combine it with a local secret, connect to Pythia, use it to apply in another key, and get it back, and use that to either protect your uh, Braincoin wallet or use it directly as your Bitcoin wallet. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Password storage is broken because databases are routinely compromised, and when they are, using current techniques, there's no way to prevent offline dictionary attacks. But what I presented today is a new solution, an architecture for protecting passwords built around the Pythia PRF. And Pythia's design is a modern web service. It lets clients of this service inherit the security of the uh, service provider without just handing over sensitive, to the, sensitive information to that service provider and just hoping for the best. And with that, thank you, and I'd love to hear any questions. <laughs>